Yay, we're doing it. It's here. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> Uh, we both have colorful couches. I feel like we color coordinated the couches. I know, right? <laughs> it's a tough thing to do. <laughs> we have our books and like we're doing the whole damn thing. Um, I am so excited about tonight because I got my editor for Everything's Trash. She was like, there's this book I think you might like. I have like advanced copy. And I was like, okay, I'll check it out. And I like truly on page one, I was like, I'm in. This is gonna be a great day. <laughs> I was like, yes, please, yes, please, yes, yes, please. Um, but oh, so happy. <laughs> but you know, your book is called This Is Major. And before we get into our, our conversation tonight, um, I just wanted to say that I, I just think it's such a wonderful, fresh book to have especially during these times to just have like a black woman's narrative and not have it be like i think while people are learning a lot right now i think so much of black culture that's being presented in the media is just of suffering and just like pure sadness and i love that your book is so complex you have such a fascinating life story that like if you guys get this book you'll read about it. i don't want to spoil anything but there's so much like amazingness in here you like write poetry you write essays and you you're funny and you're raw and you're honest and so i really do think like this is major you guys are going to love this book um and i just thought it was so phenomenal and amazing and i'm so so happy for you um so i was wondering if maybe you could give people a sneak peek as to what to expect in Musa passage yes i will read a passage I'm going to read the intro poem. Students, open it. I'm just kidding. Yeah, class. Open, I mean, this does feel a lot like teaching on Zoom. Once I, you know, I, but this is way more fun because, you know, like here I am reading with Phoebe Robinson, who also did, you know, like Michelle Obama's a book tour. You know, like I'm essentially the, the Michelle Obama of my home. You are. <laughs> that is the one thing that I can do right now. It's Michelle Obama. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean it's it's incredible that I that you had the response to the book that you did. That you reached out to me and told me, hey, you know, this book is pretty amazing because it's been a tough time, especially the pandemic, to know like is it landing you know are people enjoying it and i hope they are in their little hobbles so i'm gonna read this poem that i wrote in the book public service announcement you are here the color of this book is grace jones strapped into an electrical socket the patron saint a black and white photograph of diana ross and julian rib this book's therapist of record paris josephine baker the official art piece of this book is Lorna Simpson's wigs. The official hair piece of this book is 100% Kennecalon, Tank and the Bangas, the official sew-in. The cheat code to this book is Drop It Down. This book's favorite nickname is SZA. This book once got lost in a forest of no names blowout, only to come out a Simone Miles medalist. <laughs> this book's sister wrote a Mary Bethune report by hand in third grade. This book's for her. This book's first crush was Fast Cars, then Tracy Chapman. This book's favorite role play is Reverse Ben Dominant. Favorite country, Dominique Jackson. This book lost its virginity to the remix of I Get Lonely, sung by Janet Jackson's crochet braids featuring Blackstreet. This book knows the meaning of Nehu. It does not speak in tongues, but it does understand how did you get here, Deborah Cox. This book can't decide if the weather today is Michelle Obama's side arms or Michelle Obama's side eye but it will show up late, pressed and dressed, you best believe. One time, this book almost got pregnant. This book's plan B would be knitting mittens off the cover of Platinum Motown albums, The Supremes, The Pichinongo, its best season. And if this book goes to jail, it will be for reciting the entire nothing but death monologue from The Color Purple. This book will bring the best peach cobbler to your funeral and the best fried whiting to your Caucasian house Joanne the Scammer Christian picnic. Instead of get better, this book says Ida B. Wells. This book's favorite hair salon is Kayla Newman, 
on fleek. And if this book had one wish, it would be that every day is the day that dark skin on Viv wore a lip pink leotard and danced the Dougie. This book discovered the equation for dark matter between Slickwood's teeth, Zadie Smith's on beauty divided by Betty Shabazz. This book's Rite Aid shopping list reads dreams, wine, Carmex, Kotex. A Lynn Whitfield soliloquy is its favorite convenience store. This book's Shondaland TGI turnip is another round cooking up their version of Sandra Lee's Kwanzaa hate cake. This book's favorite hair care regimen is The Lady of Rage. Tyra Banks, its favorite financial institution. This book's favorite game sign is FKA Twigs. This book wants a selfie with Dean Lawson, Dina Lawson's living room. This book still smokes blacks and writes Venus Williams love letters in chocolate Sharpie. And if you're broke down, the service manual for this book is Erica Badu's interview for Pitchfork. Underrated. This book's fertility notification is a picture of Minnie Whipperton fisting melted ice cream. And when it gets busy, it Audre Lords, Nina Simone's. This book's favorite pastime, Jennifer Lewis. This book's favorite temple is Eartha Kitt. The official book club of this book is Edna Lewis, Biscuits. And the unofficial ordained reverend of this book is a Maxine Waters filibuster. This is your June Jordan, your Rosa Parks, your Billy Porter Met Gala Realness Elementary School. Your senior high school yearbook supportive crossed out and scrawled down as Fenty. This book's favorite scripture is Song of Solomon 5, but it blocks out comely for fly. Look, this book, Toni Morrison's. This book just got married to a picture of Tracy Ellis Ross and wrote Lisa Binet as its plus one on the Save the Day Evite. This book asks every story, what would Pat Evans' shaved head do? And the moral of this story is, you're welcome. I mean, come on, Shayla, that's so great. I love that. Okay, well, so, no, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you and me in here, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's just so much that I loved about this book. And one of the things that really stuck out to me is you are a woman who has traveled. You have lived many lives within one. And I think a lot of times people think that black women don't go anywhere, don't have any like experiences outside the country, even outside their city. Um, so I'm really curious as to, you know, when you're going through the world and you're traveling and you're writing this down and sharing these parts of your lives with you, like what, first of all, how did you get your travel bug? And B, was it also important for you to short, to sort of show that like black women have these really diverse, like rich, wonderful experiences that take them all over the world? Yeah, and it's great because they're kind of the same answer for me. There was a point when I was in uh, elementary school where my parents bought us this uh, encyclopedic um, collection of books about uh, African Americans and their contributions. And I just remember, you know, looking at books about Ida B. Wells and Josephine Baker and thinking about the, the fact that we were everywhere in Lorraine Hansberry, um, thinking about the Harlem Renaissance, and that was the world that I wanted. Um, I felt like um, I was introduced, even though my parents really didn't have the opportunity to travel, I was introduced very early to the fact that we were everywhere. My parents had um, a lot of friends who were diasporic, Nigerian, Ghanaian. There was a point where my dad had somebody bring uh, me and my sister back pieces of the Berlin Wall when it came down. Um, so they always kept this idea open to us that the world wasn't just Lexington, Kentucky, which was very small and not particularly uh, fond of us living there. Like my family was the first uh, family to integrate the neighborhood that I lived in in 1989. <laughs> wow. Which meant that uh, we weren't treated very nicely. Um, uh, my sister and I would call the N-word. We tried to ride the bus. Um, we had neighbors come and slash our tires. We had all sorts of stuff happen to my family. Um, and so books was books was it. Like books was the thing that told me there was a world outside there for Black women where we got to uh, be beautiful and we got to be vulnerable and we got to be protected. Um, and I think that was what always motivated me to see the world. When I thought about the juxtaposition of what Josephine Baker's life is like here mm -hmm. versus Paris, um, it just felt like an answer to me to to what I could be. And I was 
um, in my 20s when I first uh, went out of the country, the first trip that I ever took was uh, to Barcelona. And I just got the bug and I just kept going back until I eventually lived there and moved there and learned different languages and fell in and out of love with different people and had a whole life that revolved around uh, coming in and out of this, my home country, and then lots of other places that I now think of as my home. Um, and so what did you learn? Because I feel like whenever I travel, you have one set of experiences when you go to a place and then when you write about it, it unlocks other things that maybe happened that you didn't fully process at the time. So maybe the, any of the places that you've been, um, whether it's like Italy or do you, what, what did you, what else did you learn about yourself when you were writing about your different adventures? That's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that has come out of it is that I have, um, I don't know. I think one of the, like, I'm still adjusting to living in the world as a writer and living in the world as somebody that people notice because my travels have always been a pretty uh, quiet or secret part of me because it's not what people want in terms of the story of a black girl. You know, when I was working, when I was working in marketing, when I was working in an office, um, it might be fun in terms of an interview, but like on the daily, people don't want to process me as a black woman who might have more say or more experience or be more worldly. Um, and so I was always keeping myself in this very contained package that was easy for people to take. And so to have people react to the fact that I had to what, when you start to put it on paper, it looks like this very glorious yeah. life. And it has been, like I've been very lucky in terms of what I've seen in the world. What I got out of it is the fact that I need to tell more of this story. Mm. And I had just kind of taken it for granted that that was a part of me that was very private and that was very um, influential into how I thought about my blackness. I think, I, you know, what I remember when I first came back from, um, it was my second trip in, in my second, the first time in Italy I studied abroad and did architecture. Second trip, I went to work as an intern at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum and I got to be the assistant to the chief conservator was also the man who uh, re, uh, refurbished the Sistine Chapel. Like, you know, these were big things in the world that black girls didn't get to usually do. And then um, coming back, I just realized how little I had been able to think of myself or conceptualize myself, how small I'd always made myself. And I was like, thank God that I got to leave the country because otherwise, like, I mean, I'm from I'm from the country. I'm Southern. Like, I would have always been like in in certain ways like a very small Southern girl. I think about a lot of the girls that I grew up with, and we have this self-deprecating way um, that's very cultural, but it also makes it feel like uh, there's there's less of you there. It's like, oh, you know, the mac and cheese turned out kind of good. Like, how, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's just like this, this, this is the most, you know, this is bomb ass mac and cheese. Like, what did you put in it? Like, what did yeah. you do? Like, what did you sprinkle on this to turn it into what it is? And to be able to like claim now the fact that I've done these amazing things and I've turned into an incredible adult and that I have so much more to share with the world and so much more to say is just super exciting. And it's one of the things that I thought about when I first came back was how do I get other people who look like me to understand that our world is bigger than the ways that we're treated here, the second class citizenship that we have in our own country. And writing became a way that I could do that. But it's been a process to get that to be a story that people want. So I've, yeah. I've suffered for years from the fact that a lot of the response that I get from, from publishers is this idea of, um, you know, we, we appreciate what you're doing, but we just don't think that fits the the black female story we just don't think that people will be able to relate to what you're saying and what's been lovely about talking to people about the book and you know particularly black women particularly black women uh, in in the industry tv film they're like no this is exactly what we want to see yeah because this is where we found ourselves too like this is you know this is who we are this is the major part of what makes us understand how awesome we are so that is something that really excites me is I'm going to keep working on that, keep telling that story, figure out places to put it. Nice. So do you feel like writing this book in particular helped you feel more comfortable with taking up space? 
I hope so. It's really yeah. hard to tell in a pandemic <laughs> because I really got so much of the space to go into. I was really <laughs> hoping I was going to go into the world and be like, hey, y'all, I wrote this book. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, if there's a world to go out, you know, back out into a year from now, I'm really hoping that I'll get to take up a lot more space in it. Um, yeah. But yes, I mean, I, it definitely did. Um, and I think what, what freed me in writing this book was the responsibility to the history that I felt like I had. Once I started going to the library and researching all these women that I thought I knew, you know, I thought I knew Diana Ross, or I thought I knew Nina Simone. And then I was, looked at how hard it was for them and I realized um, that even I had taken for granted the contributions that they made. And I was like, uh-uh, like, I'm not, I'm also not gonna play small anymore. I've gotta figure out a way to make sure that that doesn't happen to us and that it also doesn't happen to me. So we'll see. It helps that I'm a little bit older now, you know, like I'm trying to take up a lot more space when I'm like, you know, getting ready to turn 38, so. Woohoo! Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's time. You know, I've waited quite nearly forty years to take up space. So, right now. <laughs> Um, so there are so many um, things in this book that I love. I want to jump to super quick. Um, oh my gosh, where is it? Uh, I'm sorry for thought. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. Can Somebody's you? saying they can't hear me very well, so I'm going to play around with this for a second. Can you guys hear it better? Let us know. Let us know. Let us know. Sounds good. Yeah. Center for Victor says, Zoe, I'm not sure what. Yeah. I'm Zoe, I'm not sure what. <laughs> We're doing the best we can. Yeah. <laughs> like, this, is, this is a home studio I set up myself. If you can see how Gary rigged this thing is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, so I wanted to dig into the book a little bit. There's so many essays and poems that yeah. I love. Yeah, Love Song for Thoughts. Um, okay. And the title right away, I was like, oh, this is so amazing, iconic, I love it. Um, and it also got me, the title got me thinking about just language and how certain words come into the lexicon and we don't even think about sort of like the negativity that comes with it. Like, it's just like, oh, that hoe over there. Like any woman who's not sort of consider like the perfect proper woman according yeah. to patriarchy is a thought. And so I even got sucked into just calling like just random women who are like totally fine, just like thoughts or whatever. So like now I try to call guys thoughts too, but I don't even know if that's like pronouncing <laughs> it out. Um, but I just really liked sort of, it made me think about the way that we use language to sort of just absentmindedly sum up a person in a negative way. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, when you wrote this essay, like, what did you want the reader to sort of walk away from when they finished reading it? I think it, this essay is a lot of fun for me because it started with my divorce, like going back out into the, because I did all the things that a Southern girl is supposed to do, like have a white wedding, like, um, and then after I got divorced, I, you know, I was back out in the world. I was yeah. young and I was single. I was like, I want to do what everybody else did during this yeah. time. <laughs> I stayed together and had a job and all the things. It was a housewife. And um, so that was how I got introduced to the term thought. And I was like, what is this thought business? Like, how do I become one? Like, what does it, you know, is there a club? Like, what is it that I have to do? <laughs> um, and so I was fascinated by the word, particularly because I was in graduate school at the time. I was in graduate school for poetry, so I was thinking a lot about language. And I think a lot about the ways that language is used um, uh, to control black people. Uh. So thought as a word that's used to control black women or black femmes in particular, I find uh, pretty fascinating. Because when I started looking, you know, at first I was like, yes, let's, you know, let's spot it up. Like, you know, I was really excited about the idea of, you know, and still am. Like, I mean, it's, it's a term that I use with endearment. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, even my dog, you know, I watch, like, I watch my dog and his thoughty behavior. Like, we, <laughs> we all thought ourselves out every now and then, you know, the art of thoughtistry, as my friend Shannon says. Um, but yeah, I, 
was interested in the fact that when I saw it showing up in music and what it took to qualify as being a thought uh, would sometimes be something as simple as um, asking for emotional support yeah. or, you know, <laughs> uh, I thought that she was a good girl and then she went out with her friends and, you know, had some drinks and had a good time. And I'm like, so she's fun. Yeah, she's this a, a cool. She, this was a sexier. So, yeah. And that felt so close to what I was used to um, coming out of Southern culture and its expectation of women's bodies and the control of women's bodies, and particularly Black girls, because in this construct of uh, what for me was like a Southern Belle society, there are things that women should and should not do and regulate how we decide to use our sexual autonomy is one of those things. And if you're a black girl, what happens is that the desire to want to regulate your own autonomous sexual life means that you are a bad person. It immediately jumps to the conclusion that you are someone who is dangerous. Yeah. And that is so parallel to the ways that we use language against black people in other, uh, you know, in other structures like that you I talk about um, the N word and all its iterations and what that means for us culturally as well. And so when I got to the end of Love Songs for Thoughts, what I really wanted to do was humanize black girls, like bring us back into a space where we could be seen as soft and learning and intelligent and full of a spiritual reverence for our bodies that also involves the ways that we might look at ourselves um, centrally as well as sexually. I just watched uh, the movie Jin and I just thought it was so beautiful because I felt it was doing a very similar job of telling the story of a young high school girl who is developing a relationship with, uh, with Muslim culture and what it means for her to juxtapose that, that spiritual reverence with this reverence that she has for her body and her ability to use it and, and put it into spaces. And that's what I wanted us to get out of Love Songs for Thoughts. SZA felt like the perfect archetype of that yeah. um, because she talks so much about her spiritual upbringing mm -hmm. and how instead of what she does being counter to the way that she was introduced to the world through that spirituality, it being a product of her ongoing love of herself and her ongoing development of a, uh, a self-awareness. And I was like, that's beautiful. And that's very black girl. And I wanted to celebrate it. So it's like the longest essay in the book. <laughs> lots, to, lots to celebrate and lots to say. So yeah, brings me a lot I, of I loved it. Um, another aspect of the book that I want to talk about is your time living in Portland, Oregon. Um, because I, you know, I've always been like, oh yeah, I really like Portland for like going for a stand up or like performance or whatever. And someone asked me, would you ever live here? And I was like, no, it's like, there's not enough black people here. So I, I never would. And they're like, it's such a nice place. And I was like, you don't know what it's like to be a black person in a predominantly white space. So you write about this in the book and I don't wanna like spoil it too much, but I really want you to sort of like talk a little bit about your experience living there and how you felt like that sort of shaped you a little bit as an adult. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because you wrote of Portlandia. So you have yeah. a specific sense of what it's like to be looking at Portland as a sub, you know, you're pretty, uh, well researched when it comes to Portland culture. Yeah. So, um, oh goodness, it's funny because I can see like the comments from some of my Portland friends, and the <laughs> Portland you know, PTSD is this real. Is just like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta get into it. We gotta get into it. You know, like when you. Um, my friend Shannon is saying like Portland P PTSD is real and that that's true. Um, it's really, because the first, when you say the word Portland, the first thing that comes up for me is my pain. Um, the things that happened to me, the things that happened to my body. I started wearing this necklace, um, not this version, because Lorraine West made this one. She designs jewelry for Erica Batu. <laughs> not to <laughs> brag, but to brag. Yeah. So, you know, anyway. <laughs> I just, I'm always trying to 
make the plug. Like if y'all want, you know, a beautifully designed piece of piece of custom jewelry or a major necklace, go to her website. Um, but that said, like uh, Portland was incredibly painful for me. I grew up in Kentucky, so I know racism. <laughs> and Portland's got its own. It's got its own very specific brand of racism that we don't know how to talk about because we have a hard time associating uh, liberal or neoliberal whiteness with um, with a purely racist intent. And when we look at somewhere like Portland, it is historically built on the idea of being a white utopia that removes any kind of BIPOC existence. Um, they destroyed the indigenous communities there. They refused to let black people live there. It was still a sundown town until 1996. You can find pictures of the mayor of Portland, um, you know, arm in arm with the Klan, literally arm in arm in the Klan from 1937, where it says that, you know, secret organization has ideas on how Portland can deal with its black folk. And then you get to Portland and people are like, but we're so nice. <laughs> it's like, there's no way <laughs> <laughs> that you have gotten over what, what is not even, um, what is still recent history, which is, you know, the, the, uh, and so that constant erasure of pain is something that uh, a lot of the BIPOC people that I met in Portland and a lot of, you know, my friends are still there, my, you know, my black uh, femme and woman, non-binary friends who are still there are still experiencing. Um, and it's, it's rough. It's also interesting because my career would not have taken the turns that it did, like the meteoric shift from me being, uh, I started in Portland, I was, I was a middle school teacher five years ago. Yeah. Um, and now I'm here. <laughs> and Not how much I would have been able to do without Portland, but also I had to do that in Portland because there was no place for me. And I've never lived anywhere that was so viciously set on the idea that um, I was dangerous. And so every time I would try, you know, cause I was deceived by the idea that we're, oh, Portland is so, so nice. You know, everybody's so liberal. So I thought, oh, well, if I bring to your attention the fact that some of the things that are happening here shouldn't be happening, wouldn't even be allowed to happen in Lexington, Kentucky, where I come from, um, then you should be able to handle that well. And the response that I got unilaterally was always, you don't belong here. And so I went through three successions of jobs in which each time uh, the company organized to try and fire me. And twice I got, yeah, <laughs> twice I got, after I had it happen to me the first time, I got out twice uh, before I would allow that to happen. But that's something that you don't get over in your body very yeah. easily. That, that, that I had never lived with that kind of fight or flight mentality. Um, and so it taught me something new about the black experience in America, which I didn't think that I could learn. <laughs> um, I really thought, you know, like in my mid thirties, I'm like, I've seen y'all do everything. And I was like, no, I haven't. Yeah. So that humbled me. I think it furthered my awareness of the importance of speaking out, even in the midst of realizing that so often it meant the threat of my home, my literal home or my job. Um, my sanity, um, but I just realized I wasn't going to be the kind of person who lived with, um, that lived with less just because that was what was allotted for me. Um, and if somebody needs to work that hard to make me feel threatened or scared in order to protect this utopia that they've developed, um, something is insidiously wrong with that. And that's something that I am going to continue to to speak out about to work to work against as best that I can um, because the other thing that they do is that they recruit us in droves they give us this idea of like you know you can come here and you can have your weed and your bicycle and all your books and there's this huge community of, of uh, people of color who feel like I've never fit in so since I'm kind of like the weird black girl let me go out here to this west coast place where they want me and then you get there and you realize that the reason why they want you is because they want to cover over how much damage they have done to the people who are native to that society, the people who are, you know, even if we go farther back, indigenous to that society. We look at the Latinx and, you know, 
and Native American populations. And it's just, it's just patently wrong. Um, but we're still presenting this idea that the Pacific Northwest is some kind of bastion of progressiveness. And it reminds me a lot of what it was like for me living in the Netherlands, where I was living in the Netherlands at the time that they had their version of 45. So there was this dude, I think his name was, uh, I get his name wrong, but I think it was like Harry Van Wilder, so it was something very Dutch. But like, you know, he, like, he'd come over and burn uh, Qurans in front of the World Trade Center just, you know, for vacation. And um, I watched being an immigrant there, what it was like to be in a position where people saw me as dangerous. I, you know, I went from one day, oh, we're so nice, we're so liberal, you know, we have the most diverse population in all of Europe, to the next day, my neighbor being like, yeah, we should really get rid of all the foreigners. And then a month later, like going to the grocery store, nobody would touch my hand to give me back my change. And then a month after that, having a man stop me in front of my house to, um, to try and solicit me for sex because he thought I was a prostitute. Like, that's why these things matter about representation and, and how we frame blackness and what it means for us to import a blackness in order to say that we are so nice and see we are so representative of a diverse audience is because this is usually what happens. It's this declension into uh, spaces where things are, you know, are just a mess. <laughs> Obviously, I have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good to talk about, about because I, I feel like, you know, I would go to Portland and you would see like the Black Lives Matter sign, but I'm like, there are no black people here. So how can you even say that you like are really in it? You know what I mean? Yeah, and especially yeah. when we're, we're looking at communities that have removed, they have, have put in ordinances in place to remove black people yeah. from the possibility of even living within the city of Portland. Um, right. A large scale erasure of, um, it's good, Albina. I always want to say Albina. I always want to do like the British <laughs> version of, of, of <laughs> Albina. But like, I think about Albina and how Albina was the one place that black people could live and how by 1975, they had created, or the, the city of Portland had created ordinances where it didn't even exist anymore. If we go further back in the 1950s, Vanport uh, it got to up to 13% black as its population, and they allowed the entire town to be flooded. So people were killed and homeless. And then, you know, you go, like, even I, I used to live in the Pearl District, and just how long it took for me to find out that Pearl was a black woman, Pearl was a philanthropist who used to provide all of the homeless people in that area with, uh, with housing and sustenance. But it's one of the richest suburbs in Portland and you would never, you would, you would like the, the, the portrait you get is the idea of, oh, it's called the Pearl because it's so pretty. No, it's called the Pearl because this used to all be owned by a black woman. So what happened where all of her relatives, all of the people that would have inherited this property because it belonged to her, where did it go? Like, where did that money go? Where, what happened with this system in order to make sure that, that story is erased and we see something different, you know, even as a black person that you see something different, that you're not, uh, that it takes a lot of education to get to the story of what's going on in Portland. And I was lucky because since I have uh, a relationship to, um, to like being in, the, in art culture, I got to meet a lot of people very quickly. Uh, like listening to Walida uh, Imarisha give speeches and spending time with Samia Bashir and spending time with Lisa Jarrett, people who are all academics and have lived all over and, you know, kind of know what things are like. Um, but that's not the case for everybody. Like not a lot of people, they look at what's going on. They're like, I know this is wrong, but everybody's telling me that where I'm living is okay. So yeah. it probably means that I'm the problem. And that's, you know, where that Portland PTSD starts coming in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned um, when we were talking about Portland, how you know you were a middle school teacher five years ago. Now you have a book of essays. You have three books of poetry. So I mean, you have done a lot in the span of five years, which is amazing. And so I want to know, like, what sort of was like the final thing that made you go, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna give it a go as a writer and try and get my work out there. I didn't have a job. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of those things, you know, I was in between, I was in between things. I got fired again. I was like, oh, great. This is cute. Um, 
And what was funny about it is that I had gotten an email from Janisha Watts, who I went to college with, and um, it was right after Muhammad Ali had just died. And uh, she was like, hey, we're looking for somebody from Kentucky to write something for Muhammad Ali. She worked for ESPN. She wanted something to commemorate that. And so I wrote a poem. And I had never been paid for a poem before. Because <laughs> nobody, nobody watched poetry. Like, there's too much poetry in the world. So that was the moment, you know, when I realized um, that people wanted to hear what I had to say, that I didn't just have to work for somebody else, that I didn't have to apply my voice to somebody else's dream, that I started thinking, well, how can I do this? Um, so my first step personally was to move into marketing because I knew that if I was going to make writing work, I need to figure out how to market myself. So I started taking freelance gigs in marketing that turned into a short career in social media marketing. So I wrote for Nike and Google through um, some different companies. And, um, through that time I met my, my agent, um, and we started working on the proposal for the book. And I never thought that we would sell it because I was like, Carrie, I'm a poet. Like, who's going to want to hear anything from a poet who fails it, they, who has a failed presence on social media? Um, but surprisingly, somebody, you know, so you can come back from anything. Um, yeah, surprisingly, somebody wanted uh, the story. And I, and, they can, and I, you know, this is the Southerness. I'm playing it down. Like, I, I wrote this book because I needed to eat and I needed to stay alive. And the only thing that has ever been kind to me in that way has always been writing. Like even during the recession, I watched a lot of people lose their jobs and I didn't because I was a really strong writer. And as a black person, I always grew up with this idea that you need to have a job that sounds like a job. You know, you need to be a doctor, you need to be a lawyer, you need to be a, you yeah. know, a pediatrician, you need to, you know, like, it's the same thing. Engineer, you know, you need to do something that's got a label. And so I tried to go that route with architecture, but then when the recession hit, and I was like, well, people aren't building things, but they still need, they still need language. And um, that has always been what's happened for me is that when things stop working out, writing always does. And I think that's the thing that I just had to listen to. Uh, like, instead of trying to you know, push into places that don't want me. I'm like, well, who does? And I'm like, well, yeah. she does. Yeah. And she gave me a lot of joy in letting me bring her into the world and tell these stories. That's amazing. Now we have, before we open up to um, Q and A, you guys remember to write your questions below and also click on the button where you can buy this book right now. Bye, Tip your wing staff, do all those things. <laughs> So we'll probably open up Q&A in like maybe five to 10 minutes. Um, so you guys have time to write in your questions. Um, so what inspires you, Shayla, as a writer? I'm always curious because I feel like every writer has very different and specific answers to that question. Oh, musicals, springtime, <laughs> people who smell good in white t-shirts. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I just really love being alive and I really like celebrating it through any, any form that I can in my body. And I think writing is probably my most successful. Um, and so that's, that's why I do it. I just feel a lot of joy. And I think that joy is particularly important and revolutionary based on the ways as a black woman that I've been treated. Um, it's not easy to stay somebody who can talk about loving things like screen time yeah. <laughs> and, and, and be black. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so being able to hang on to that and using writing as a way to archive that, like I love that you mentioned the fact that at a time where we hear so much about the atrocities that are happening to black people, having this pink and yellow book becomes important because yes, there are a lot of horrible things that have happened to me and the women in this book but that's not the focus it's not about the it's not about the aggressor it's about the love and the self-love that i've had to develop in order to to get to a place where i can tell my story and also the fact that i've been loved by some really incredible people you know a lot of them keep showing up in the chat which brings me you know so many other reasons to keep writing <laughs> 
I, I, I get to have joy and share, and that makes me happy. Okay, so you saw you saying that this book helped you with your self love. What what are two or three things that you love most about yourself now? Oh, <laughs> that gets really deep. Oh, what, a, what I love <laughs> about myself? Okay, so one of the things that I love, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get close. Like, and I, I just, I'm like, there's a good chance that a tit's gonna pop out. But that's. So I'm so me. jealous. I am so like, glad this 34A life is not the jail. Oh, well, this is the thing. I didn't have tits until I was 32. So I didn't know what to do with them. You know, so I'm always like, I'm just like, oh, just, oh, there it is. Like, they not expect it to be there. Like, I still haven't got, they, they've been here five years. I'm not used to them. So I never know what to do with them. So I'm always like, okay, let's, let's make sure. Anyway, like one of the things I'm proud of is I gave myself baby hairs today. I'm yes. Like, like, that's something. <laughs> so, like, the reason why it makes a difference is because, like, that, I, I did it as kind of a nod to my sister because my sister was always like the baby hair, like lip gloss black girl. And I was always like the, you know, nappy edges, let's read roots black girl. <laughs> Both valuable. <laughs> but, you know, I just, I really, I, I really, really delight in being a black woman. I really delight in being a black girl, being a black femme, like, getting to live in the world in this body as hard as it is um, feels completely worth it because um, I I really love, I, I love that my laugh is loud. I love that I have um, hair that I can make an eternal art project with. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that I love people very deeply because I know what it's like to lose them. You know, if you don't have anything to lose in this world, you love people very differently. I remember when I was in Italy, um, there was a, a guy that I worked with at the museum, at the Guggenheim Museum, and he was Italian. He was like, I really love the way that you hug because you mm -hmm. actually let go. And that to me even made me think, oh, that's, that's a very black girl thing, you know, like that vulnerability of allowing somebody to really um, to hold you or touch you, even if you're not very close to them. Like that's something that we do with each other and we do with the people that we feel comfortable with. And so I'm, I, that was what I got out of this book was really that little girl who read all of those books that made her really happy to be a black girl, like mm -hmm. got to write one and then also sit with the idea of now that I get to be this black girl in the world to other people. And that makes me happy. Oh, that's such a good answer. I love that. And that's a perfect segue to questions because questions. we have seven questions. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to start with um, what are, this is from Sonia. What are some of your cultural and literary influences? Oh, that's great. Okay. I was actually thinking about this when I took a shower today because um, I figured somebody would ask and I needed to be ready. So um, there is a Toni Morrison epigraph in the beginning of the book, so very much so Toni Morrison, but then also um, for Colored Girls was very much Toni K. Bambara. Um, it's an ode to Intosake Shange, so there you get another <laughs> literary reference. Uh, Intraracial Dating was Alice Walker. Alice Walker has this story, um, something like, how did I, you know, how did I kill the biggest lawyer? It's in her book, um, uh, you can't keep a black woman down. And she has a story, how did I kill the biggest lawyer in the state? It was easy, something like that. So like I, I went through and I started looking at my literary heroes and I looked at the ways that they wrote and I adapted that style to write the different essays. So each essay was me approaching um, voice from the perspective of what I'd learned from other uh, black woman authors. I mean, Audre Lorde is a huge, has a huge influence on me. Um, Nikki Giovanni, when I went to, to the poems, um, yeah, Sonia Sanchez. I could like it's. <laughs> I could go on and on and on because I just feel that's one thing that um, you know. I'm going to be a teacher for a minute. You know, any of you younglings out there, one of the things, especially if you're my kids, I see some of my students out here too. Um, that you know about me is that one of the things I can't stand is when people say um, I had to write the book that I I didn't see because it didn't exist in the world, and I and I feel like. I hear that said by people who are marginalized more than anyone. And I just feel like that's entirely bullshit because what it does is it denigrates the work that so many people have done to make space for you. 
and it means that you haven't read enough because um, what you have read are spaces where you have been excluded as opposed to the books yeah. that have actually been working ardently to include you. So I am so happy to come out of a really rich literary canon. And there's so, I could just, I could name names forever. I think about ZZ Packer was probably the first person, uh, short story collection that I read recently where I thought, oh, I could totally, by reason I mean like six years ago, I could totally do prose. Like there's something about her prose and the fact that she also had stories that were rooted in Kentucky. Um, yeah, like <laughs> I could do this for a long time. So, you know, <laughs> you know, at some point, just, you know, come hang out with me. You can hang out on my porch and I can tell you what everybody has <laughs> to Okay, speaking of school, this is a perfect seg segue. This question is from Christopher. Dream syllabus. This is major. Oh, wait, sorry. Another question came in, so I got to scroll back up. Hold on. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wait, where is it? Where? Christopher, dream syllabus. Oh, there we go. Dream syllabus. This is major comes the week after blank and the week before blank. Oh, that's a hard one. I okay. know. It comes, um, I feel like it would come goodness. The hard thing for me is that I can't think of, of this, I can't think of this author's name, but there's a, recently there's a femme author who wrote a book on pleasure activism. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to, I, you know, if anybody in the comments knows the book that I'm talking about, it's, it's a short book and it talks specifically about the ways that uh, BIPOC people use their bodies, um, particularly in like um, the queer spectrum as a, um, as a means of revolution. And so I feel like that would be a book that I would love uh, to come before me. And I think after me, I would love um, Zami by Audre Lorde, um, going you know backwards in the canon and looking at um, how uh, this formation of like a pride in the body starts to come. So I'd love it being sandwiched in between people who look at uh, black femininity and black bodies in terms of pleasure and revolution. Ooh. Yes, Pleasure Activism by Adrian Marie Brown. I knew somebody, yes. yes. I'm going to buy Marie that Brown. book. I mean, we always want to shout out <laughs> the <laughs> names. Yeah, because yeah, the other book is beautiful and I think really, really necessary. Yeah. I love that. I can't wait to buy that book. Okay, so this question is from Ashley. Kind of a two-part question. What are ways that adults can help stop the over-sexualization of young Black girls? Being the only girl, an eldest girl cousin, and a male-dominated Black family, it's hard to explain this concept to Black men specifically. What are some tips you can offer, if any? That It's interesting that you mentioned that because in my chapter, Interracial Dating, there was actually um, a quote from Toronto Burke that I ended up taking out in edits because um, it just mm -hmm. kept moving farther and farther away from the mm -hmm. structure. Um, that talks about how we need to stop uh first of all you know like first of all that it starts with language like we need to stop referring to young girls as women and we need to stop referring to young boys as men um i think that is that is a place to start i think um in terms of like it's still a thing that I'm trying to figure out in terms of what works for me and what works for our community and how do you have these conversations. When I looked at interracial dating, one of the things that I was concerned about and love songs for thoughts was the ways that people would look at it and focus on um, the ways that me and the other characters in the story choose to use our bodies. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that has <clears throat> consequences. And I think the thing that we have to take away is the fact that we spend too much time looking at this as a consequence society as opposed to an accountability society. And the thing that we need to focus on is the accountability and the sickness that is someone who thinks that they can have control of your body and that they are allowed to look at you and sexualize you um, as a child when you are trying to figure things out, that you need to be given the space in order to understand what your body is. How do we get people to do that? I don't know. You know, particularly uh, coming from where I'm coming from as a black woman, I don't I don't know very many people who haven't been uh, who haven't been hurt, male or female. Um, 
but I know these are conversations that we need to have. I think one of the things that helps me is that there's so much more information out there and there are so many people who are doing a really beautiful job uh, who are much better ed educated in these spaces than I am about uh, the ways to talk about consent, um, the ways to talk about, um, to, to build conversations around what is sexual violence, what is rape. So I, I spend a lot of time looking at uh, sex worker Twitter and looking at um, any places that I can where there are people who are really invested in these conversations and see what they're saying. Because um, I found a lot of comfort in the ways that they're building language that we can use that isn't threatening to uh, the people that we're trying to talk to, it's threatening to aggressors. Why sex worker Twitter? Because they are more invested in understanding how to use this language in a way that protects people than probably anyone else. It's their, it is their literal job. And it's another place where, you know, there's this way in which we uh, facilitate violence by thinking, oh, but a woman who uses her body that way is not a good woman. Um, but these are very intelligent people that are out there having to make the sacrifice for lots of different reasons um, to figure out how to create spaces of protection as part of their occupation. And because of that, as a byproduct of that, we have a lot better information um, than I think I definitely had access to as a kid in terms of what to do. Great question and great answer. Um, okay, if we have, okay, I think maybe five to seven more minutes for questions, so I'm gonna try to get to as many as possible. Okay, this one yeah, is, sure. okay. and I'm, I really wanna get everyone's questions, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going too slow. Okay, so this is from Dan. He, he says, he writes, love the opening, as a Kentuckian, what's this book's bourbon? Oh, it's Johnny Drum. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> You're like, easy, got it, easy, moving on. You know, it's smoking and under a $30 price point. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, this next question is from Invert. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, Invert writes, you spoke a lot about the weight of words. How do you practice mindfulness when selecting the words used in your work? Oh, um, I, I do a lot of meditation, actually. I do a lot of, I have a, a pretty strong meditation and uh, like deep breathing and lucid dreaming practice. Uh, so I spend a lot of time thinking about, I think spend a lot of time thinking about words, thinking about language and thinking about how it feels in my mouth, how does it live in my body. And when I get to the page, when I have hesitations about where those words should go, I usually bold them and then go through this the thesaurus and just rotate them out. You know, I think that also comes to from, from the poetry training, um, that idea of, uh, the, I love the Mark Twain quote, the difference between the, you know, right word and almost the right word is the difference between light and lightning, because that's usually how the quote is said, but Mark Twain actually said the difference between light and lightning bugs. So that even shows you even more about like what it is about language that we need to, to pay attention to. So that's that's a lot of what helps me, just being really patient with words and, and living with them and living with them in really quiet spaces. Nice. Um, okay, this question is from Nicholas. He writes, you recently published an essay talking about the transition from poetry to essays. Can you speak further to how they intersect in your experience as a practitioner and educator? Yeah, I think the biggest intersection for me is that, as, as it, particularly because in the essay, one of the things that I talk about is the pressure that was put on me as a young teen who started in, um, a largely slam background to spend a lot of time exploiting my own trauma for the sake of like the benefit of a conversation, the benefit of a poem, and this idea that I was pushed into poetry because the idea was black and it's like, oh, you know, you should write poetry because your people are so musical, like this is where you belong. And I had to tell myself that I belonged in bigger spaces. Um, not the poetry isn't big, it's the ways that we get relegated to something like poetry or music uh, as a way of trying to, uh, to qualify our intelligence as fitting in these very specific spaces. So essays meant more space. Essays meant taking up more space. It meant more time for people to understand how I build an argument, because that was one of the things that poetry was really, why poetry was really difficult for me is because I'm a very rhetorical thinker. 
Um, and you can't always build that space into a poem. So that is, uh, for me, revolutionary. It helps me be uh, a better activist to switch between spaces. Mm, okay. So I apologize in advance if I butcher this. Hapshiba? 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 Hapshiba. Sorry. Hapshiba. She's one of my students. So. Oh, my gosh. Hi. She's one of my babies. She's one of my favorites, in fact. <laughs> um, she writes, can you describe your process of writing an essay as opposed to, or in relation to, your process of writing poetry? So with poetry, I am usually listening for something. Um, and with essays, I'm trying to answer a question for myself. So poetry, I usually receive. Um, and essays, I usually expel. I love that. Oh, that's a great way of thinking about that. Um, okay, so this is another question from Invert. I'm sure there were many, or there was many, there, I'm sure there were so many places to pull down inspiration from. How did you narrow down the subject matter? Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> you know, Invert speaks like, uh, like a writer who's had like space to make things. I'm like, well, I needed to eat. So everything that I used, <laughs> <laughs> because I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna waste any money in there. Like this, <laughs> this give me. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think what helps is this. This is like this is my fourth book, and you know I'm in the midst of writing like two more. Um, so nothing ever gets lost. I kind of knew the space of this book. I knew what the container was gonna be. Um, I had a pretty clear trajectory in terms of what the essays were going to talk about. And now what happens is I feel like there's so many people, specifically like so many names of people that I excluded just because there, there wasn't space. Uh, there's so many more uh, people that I would like to talk about. I want to spend so much more talking about the broadness of femininity as a construct and how that doesn't just apply to uh, those of us who are biologically female. Um, and so I just tell myself, you know, next book, you know, I'm, but they're going to have to pay me a little bit more money. To get exactly. <laughs> you can't put it all in, in one place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Last call for questions. Um, I just want to say that I really, I, I love this book so much. Sorry. I love this book so much. It is so fantastic. It is such a wonderful read. I feel like I learned so much. I feel like I felt so much. I thought so much. And I really just think that this is such a bright light in the world. And, you know, this is major. I can't wait for your next. You see, you're writing, you're in the middle of writing two other books right now? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you don't, because you're not. I'm writing an essay collection, another essay collection. And I am also working on a romance novel based on my time in Italy because who doesn't Ooh. want that? Like, <laughs> right? Like, who doesn't want that? Okay, so two more books. So you really just, you're overachiever to the max. Oh, always oh, just doing the most. Just <laughs> the most. Like, <laughs> but it's also like, I, I don't know, like, I. They, I, I, they, my, my parents were just go getters. Like my mom learned how to to, to speak Chinese when she, I think when she turned fifty. You know, like so I've grown up around people who are always doing the most, and so I don't even know what it's like to do less than that because yeah. I still spend a lot of time on the internet. I spend a lot of time staring at my nails and watching television. Um, I spend a lot of time just watching my dog eat peaches. So. <laughs> I'm like, you are very cute when you eat fruit. Like, and so it's not, it's not, you know, it all seems to get done somehow. It all does. Well, I can't wait for your next two books. I'm so excited for you. Thank you for blessing us with this present that is, this is major. Go get it now, people. Hit that Go link. Hit it. that link. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phoebe. And I'm so looking forward to your next book and your new podcast. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you both. We'll do this again, Phoebe, when you publish your book, Shayla can interview you. Oh, oh yeah, that's oh, oh, yes. Look. And maybe we can actually gather, gather at the center for Phoebe. <laughs> <laughs> to be an interviewer. Thank you both. That was fantastic. Buy the book here uh, and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.